Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kane's Independent Media Production. Today, we are talking about a fundamentally important concept when it comes to drums and sound. What is the value of a drum sound? There's a perspective prevalent in the drum community that as you start to get into more expensive, rarefied drums, especially snare drums, that it's intrinsic that they should be unmuffled, that they should be wide open, that the value of that drum and the value of the sound of that drum is in it being wide open, full spectrum. But I mean, what do we have here? We have a very fine, very rare, very early bird's eye maple craviato. So, I mean, it would be a shame if someone were to muffle it. Now, obviously, this is nonsense. Uh, any drum is up for whatever you want to do to it. It's an instrument. It's a tool. It doesn't have a personality. It's not alive. We can do whatever we want with any of these. But the idea that when you pay into a super expensive instrument because you love something about it, that then you are married to the idea that it must be wide open at all times is a absolutely bizarre perspective when what we're dealing with is making a sound that works for the music that we're trying to generate. Now take, for example, any recorded drum sound that you've ever liked, or even one that you didn't like. Regardless of the drum used, the muffling or lack of muffling on the drum, even maybe the way that the player is hitting it, we know little to nothing about the signal chain involved, the nature of the mix, the wishes of the artist and the producer and everybody else involved that are all over the sound as it ultimately results on the record. So. I have discovered from asking people and talking to them that some sounds I hear on records that I think are heavily muffled are actually just mixed in a way where you can't hear the overtones. And then in other cases, sounds that I thought were synthetic turned out to be a expertly muffled acoustic drum played super consistently. All of these sounds are equally valuable and it doesn't matter if the drum used was thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars, or tens of dollars, as long as the resulting sound is the thing that the players, the artists, everyone involved is looking for. When you're working on a record or a recording of any kind, the bottom line is you want to get the sound and the performance that you're looking for and anything that gets in the way, any possible speed bump, we don't have time for that. We're going to do whatever we have to do to get the sound that we're looking for. Now, listen to these three drums. We're not going to show them to you. We're not going to tell you what they are. I just hit them. I tried to hit them as exactly the same as I possibly could. And listen for the value of these three sounds. First thing you notice, they're not tuned exactly the same. I'm not hitting them any differently. They're not even really tuned in particularly different ranges. But the fact of the matter is, none of these sounds is more valuable musically than any other. But on the other hand, these are three different drums and the monetary cost of these drums varies widely. It goes from $150 to $1,000 to $2,000. We are lucky enough to work with companies that are allowing us to utilize these instruments so that we can show you that at the end of the day, these are all beautiful sounds and trying to put a monetary value or any other kind of value on a single hit on a snare drum, it, it's absolutely a fool's errand. Just as a challenge, if you want to involve yourself in this little experiment, give us a comment about which one you think is the cheapest and which one you think is the most expensive and which one is somewhere in the middle. Bearing in mind that they're not three of the same drum, again, they are wildly different, but there's a lot to be heard in a single hit. At this point, we need to address the purist mentality when it comes to drums and how they should be set up and played. There is another prevalent position in the community that says that wide open, unaffected, absolutely pure drum sounds are what we should be going after, especially in recording scenarios, 
as if that's a thing that exists. The problem right out of the gate is that no matter if your drum is tuned perfectly and unmuffled, the room is affecting it, the sticks you're using is affecting it, the signal chain is affecting it, even if you're a purist to the point where you're using the shortest possible cables between all the parts of the signal chain. So to start off with the idea that we must have a pure instrument, again, as if that's a thing we can even have, and then that's the true way or the true sound of the drum, it doesn't make any sense because we're actually after a sound that facilitates the music so that we can make the art that we're working on. And if we're coming from a place of purity being the point, then that right away gets in the way of the process as we were talking about earlier. We need to remember to be open regardless of if you're sitting in front of a $50 snare drum or a $1,500 snare drum. If the $1,500 snare drum sounds worse in the track than the $50 one, don't be the guy who won't pick up the $50 snare drum because that's not the point. Let's take an example that a lot of us have heard. Ringo, the Beatles, come together. 1967, Ludwig Hollywood kit, tea towels on the toms, very muffled, very dry, very close feeling when you listen to it. Now, if we come with a purist attitude and say, oh, wouldn't that have been better if they were wide open? Wouldn't that have been better if there was no muffling anywhere? The issue here is that that's a scenario where they didn't worry about the right thing to do and they did the thing that made the sound that they were looking for. If we take wide open Bonham drums and play Come Together on them, it's the same beat, but it's not the same performance. It's not the same sound. If we cut ourselves off from these possibilities just because we're sitting in front of what is now a ridiculously rare kit, 67 Ludwigs, and say, we're not allowed to muffle them, then ironically, after we spent all that money to feel like we're Ringo, we're not gonna sound like him. So. It's kind of a paradox, like this is a situation where they utilized deep modification of the physical drums, but now we're deifying the instrument as if the unmuffled version is the right one, even though Ringo defined the sound by muffling it. Something that's happened to me in the past many times that I am 100% guilty of is showing up to a session at a studio where they themselves have a lot of drums that are super cool that I've never seen, that I know about or saw on the internet and I want to check out. And I end up pulling down a drum that I have no familiarity with because I think it'll be cool on a track, waste time fussing with it, and end up using something that I know better. This has brought me to the realization that the drum you know is better than the drum you don't, no matter what they are. And if you can learn everything about the drums that you use, especially if you have a favorite, and think of that as a benchmark rather than risking the possibility of diving into an unfamiliar instrument because you feel like it's the right thing or because it's, you know, shiny or whatever, then you're going to save yourself a whole lot of time and stick to the things you know and the capabilities that you have. And then if you run into a lack of headroom or you run into a lack of tuning range, you can reach for something else. But again, with all of these things, understanding our personal instruments and getting away from the idea that we need infinite variety or that one is better than the other in any particular situation just because of the drum that it is, we can set all that aside and continue to focus on sound for performance to get the art that we want. The bottom line is that drum sounds, as we generate them, are part of a performance. A performance gives people an emotional experience, and that's what we're here to do. And if you then chase a viewer down with your snare drum to ask them if they liked your Black Beauty or whatever it is that you have, they're probably not really going to understand the value of that the way that you do. Because the real value of that instrument is that it inspired you to play the way you played, and that's what they reacted to. It's not about the thing you were hitting. Just remember that the value 
monetarily of the drum that you're playing doesn't intrinsically mean you have to do any particular thing with it. And as long as the sound that it's making is making you happy and inspiring you, feel free to do whatever you want with that instrument. Don't get caught up in the details. Don't get caught up in the minutia of how much somebody paid for it or what it's made of or any of that. As long as you're psyched when you hit it, put a bandana on there, put your wallet on there, put moon gels on there, do whatever you want because we just want to make music. We want to move people. We want to give them an emotional experience and give ourselves one too, frankly. Just try to remember that all drum sounds are valid. Any drum sound that you're getting is good. And whether you're just starting out or been doing this for your whole life, it's all on the table all the time. And as long as it makes you happy, don't let anybody else drag you down. Doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> 